There's so much going on at the moment in the world of space that we thought it was appropriate to have an episode that doesn't have one main focus and talk about a number of different things that are going on. Yeah, but do not worry. We're not going to spend too much time talking about Artemis 1 this week. Think we've missed a story? Then get in touch. You can do this via our social media pages at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And thanks to all our wonderful Patreons who continue to support us. You guys are really incredible. If anyone else wants to be part of that, then head to patreon.com forward slash Space and Things. But right now, enjoy episode 106 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 106 of our podcast. Now, this week is a little bit different. As we said in the intro, we've got so many things going on that we want to talk about that we figured it's best not to have a main feature. So I think before we get started, it's probably best that we talk about the sad news. Yes, um, we're saddened to report the death of retired NASA astronaut Don L. Lind. He was a naval aviator with a doctorate in high energy physics. Lind was selected to NASA's Group 5 in 1966 and helped develop Apollo 11's EVA activities. In addition, he served as a backup pilot during Skylab 3 and 4 and the never-flown Skylab rescue mission with Commander Vance Brand. In 1985, he flew on STS-51B Space Lab 3 Challenger as a mission specialist and he completed 110 orbits. Uh, We send our deepest condolences to his family and friends. We've spoken about these Group 5 astronauts before. There's a real mixture, isn't there, in terms of those who flew on Apollo and those who had to wait for their flight for quite some time. And Don Lind was one of those guys who had to wait. But yeah, he waited a long time to go up into space. Yeah, he waited, I think, 19 years. I want to say he waited the longest out of everybody, but he made it and he, he did get his space flight. In 1985, uh, that mission was kind of notable, kind of for a bad reason. I believe it came the closest to having um, an O-ring incident similar to Challenger. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were like three-tenths of a second away from it happening, which, I mean, they just made it. I don't think they found out about it, obviously, until after the mission. I I read on Space Hipster, so I think Ben Evans uh, shared this. He actually painted a painting called Three-Tenths of a Second. Because he was very religious to explain to his grandchildren that, you know, God helped protect him from that. So that was back when the shuttle was, yeah, going through some crazy stuff. So that was probably a notable part about his mission. I I think he has written a book, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't know the name of it. I think it draws on his experiences, you know, being a Mormon. I believe he was the first Mormon astronaut, and that against the backdrop of his astronaut career. If you're interested in that, you know, go check it out. I'm sure it's probably on Amazon or, you know, other websites, but I know he has written a book. Uh, Wow, I had no idea about that. So I would definitely uh, head and look for that myself. We also have to report the death of astronomer Frank Drake, who was 92 years old. Uh, He pioneered the modern search for intelligent life in the universe. Mostly he's known due to an equation which bears his name, the Drake Equation, which estimates how many detectable alien societies may exist within our galaxy. He devised this way back in 1961, one year after he started Project Ozma, which used a radio telescope to hunt for signals from extraterrestrial terrestrial civilizations. His techniques and strategies are still used in this field of study six decades on, and again, we send our condolences to his friends and family. It's one of those uh, areas of study which often gets kind of looked down on in astronomy terms, isn't it? Yeah. uh, Yeah, he was a pioneer, and he didn't seem to mind fighting against the fact that people looked at those who did that as a little bit quirky. Yeah, I think it's obviously a valid area to, to study because we have such a large universe. I think the Webb telescope images really tell us how 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 small we are, really. And Yeah, absolutely. I'm not one of those people that's a real huge believer in UFOs and all that stuff. But, you know, we really do not know if there are other life forms out there. We have no idea. Is that a possibility? Of course, there's probably thousands of planets out there that we have no awareness of. 
He also was involved in uh, putting together, along with Carl Sagan and others, the uh, R.A. Sibo message in 1974, where they used the R.A. Sibo telescope, which had been upgraded at the time. They sent a message, and um, it contained a lot of things that were very Voyager Golden Record-like. Yeah. A uh, depiction of what the telescope looked like, the structure of some atoms, what an average person looked like, things like that. They sent it to Messier 13, which was in the vicinity above uh, Arecibo at the time. I don't know if we'll ever get a response back. If we do, it's going to be uh, a pretty long... Not in our lifetime. <laughs> it yeah, was a long way. Yeah, we're gonna, <laughs> we still have uh, uh, several uh, thousands of years to wait for that. So it's not going to be while well, space and things is around. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I think it was more of a or less a celebration that they upgraded the telescope, but still, it's a really cool idea sending sort of aerials to other parts of the universe just to say, hey, if you're out there, just send us a text or a message. Yeah, drop into our DMs. Drop into our DMs, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, back to the tribute, though. Yeah, it is a momentous loss for uh, SETI, and there's still a lot of people who work in that area as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, some sad news to start the podcast there. Two big losses. You're listening to Space and Things. Right. In more positive news, let's talk a little bit about your latest blog post on Medium. Fred Hayes, Apollo 13 astronaut, amongst many other things, has a new website. And it's a good one. Yeah, he has a new uh, website. It just debuted last week. He actually unveiled it when I, I was very honored for this. Uh, he unveiled it on the last day of the month to share it on Space Hipsters, which I thought was oh. which I thought was really sweet. It is called Fred Hayes dot space. What a great yes. name for a website. I mean, I didn't know that space exists, but I'm glad he's got one. Yes. And it, it is fantastic. Uh, I love the website. It's very easy to navigate. You basically you can read sections of his autobiography that didn't make it to his book. Never panic early which is still on sale. Um, It was published by the Smithsonian Press earlier this year. It also has stuff that I've never seen, stuff that he's never shared before. It has selections from his diaries, which is awesome. It has a lot of technical papers from not just Apollo, but Enterprise era, which I was just foaming at the mouth to see. I love that stuff. I just don't feel like it gets enough attention. There's also some stuff there and... I want to give people a warning before they look for it, a a trigger warning. But if you've read Never Panic Early, here's a spoiler. You may want to skip this part of the podcast, but he was in a near-fatal plane crash in the 1970s. He almost didn't make it. If you read the book, it's really just a triumph of the heart. Because when you're reading it, you're like, there's no way he's pulling out of this and going back to flying planes. And what does he do? He pulls right out of it and goes to work about a week later. Nuts. Yeah, like it's nothing like, yeah, you know, I almost died and the next week I went back to work. Granted, he wasn't fully recovered yet, but he was trying to get back to his life again. And that's just incredible because I think a lot of people would probably be like, maybe I should quit, (laughs) you know, at that point. Hmm. But he didn't. He just was like, I'm going to keep moving forward. There are journals from that time in his life. Not a fun read. But I understand why he put it out there. And there are also photos he put up of his injuries. So if you do stumble upon those, uh, a trigger warning, they're not easy to look at. But I want to say I understand why he put them out there. I can't speak for him, obviously, and, and I don't wish to speak for him. But I think he's trying to basically say that, you know, hey, you can go through all this and succeed again. Have a good life. Yeah. yeah. And he's still around. He's 88. You know, he's on social media. He's he's very positive and happy. He's doing events. I know he's doing the event at the Cosmosphere later this year. And um, Fred Hayes' life story is just like the ultimate survival story. Like, yeah, I went through all this awful stuff. You know, I almost died a few times <laughs> and he made it, you know, and he made it. And he ended up commanding one of the most incredible experimental test flight programs of all time. Fred Hayes dot space. Go check it out if you love all things Freddo, which most people do. Off the top of my head, and correct me if I'm wrong, I can't think of a similar website from another astronaut from that era. I know some of those astronauts donated their archives to various universities and museums and things like that. So 
it's not that that stuff isn't in the domain somewhere, but for someone to take control and ownership of their own stuff and put it up like he's done, I think it's really refreshing. I get a feeling that he really wants to take control of his own narrative and yeah. just put it out there for researchers because... A lot of people only know him as the guy from the movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> Apollo 13 has been written about a lot, but we're just kind of coming into the time where people are writing and, and sort of analyzing the space shuttle program. And there's a lot of stuff about that on Fredo's website. He was trying to push forward space station freedom and things like that. And I think those are things that the history for it is being written because shuttle ended not recently, but recently enough that people are still sort of like trying to figure its place out, I guess, in space history. And, and I love that he put this all out there because that adds sort of another layer of, okay, here's some more information that people can use to sort of tell the story of spaceflight, especially, oh God, I hate to toot my own horn, but I like researching space from the 1970s because that's a decade that not a lot of people talk about because there weren't a lot of human space flights on the U.S. side during that decade. And his archives really fill in a lot of blanks. (laughs) <laughs> also, you did a post this week, Emily, in Space Hipsters. I know you've not done a blog about this yet, but this was really interesting. So you read two books at once this week, uh, and you did a side-by-side comparison. Number one, how do you read two books at once? Number two, tell us about this little side thing that you've done. And are we going to see a blog post about it? Yeah, I'm planning on doing a blog post about it. I don't know when I'll publish it. It was Labor Day weekend in the United States, and I had a little bit of time off and for fun, I know people like you did this for fun. Uh, for fun, I read Buzz Aldrin's Return to Earth and I reread Fredo's uh, Never Panic Early. I had read the Aldrin book, but it was a long, long time ago. Yeah, like, when did that one come out? 1973. Oh, right. Yeah, a long time. Right? Yeah, and I read it when I was a kid and I really was not able to understand a lot of the themes in the book back then. Mm. So uh, I probably didn't understand a lot of it, but I read both books kind of at the same time. It was fascinating. I don't want to be unfair to Aldrin because he was much younger when he wrote that book. He was in his 40s, um, whereas Hayes wrote Never Panic Early. He was in his 80s, as he would say, his rocking chair years, you know. (laughs) It was amazing to sort of compare and contrast just the tone of both books because, you know, Aldrin obviously walked on the moon. He was the second man to walk on the moon. But when he came back, you know, there was that, what do I do now? By his own admission, he he got very depressed and he started drinking a lot. That book really touches upon a lot of that, but it's just incredible because reading Fred's book at the same time, that was somebody who didn't make the moon yeah. just by the skin of his teeth. I mean, he orbited it, but he didn't get to walk on it through no fault of his own. I mean, it was basically like fate happened and it was like, okay, you guys aren't going to the moon. It was amazing how different the tone was in both books. Fredo was basically like, okay, this didn't happen, but I did come home alive. And later in the book, when Fredo gets in a that horrible accident, he's like, yeah, you know, I was in the hospital for 11 weeks, you know, and he goes through some of the experiences he had to undergo in the hospital. But then, you know, he gets out of the hospital and is like, and I went right back to work the next week and started preparing for Enterprise. And I'm like, How could you do that? Like, that's incredible to me. Like, his bounce back capability was just unparalleled. It was almost cruel reading it in juxtaposition with Aldrin because Aldrin was really struggling when he came back. And to be fair, you know, he wasn't happy with being the second man. Yeah. I mean, he admits it as much in the book. Mm. I hate saying that, but he admits it. So it was just interesting to compare and contrast those things. I feel guilty almost because I feel like I'm not being fair to Buzz because I understand what it's like to go through, you know, depression. I know what it's like to drink a lot, but it's just the the tone and the attitude were different. It, it just really told me how much attitude really does count in certain situations because with Fredo, it was basically like, okay, yeah, I went through all this awful stuff and now I'm moving forward with my life, <laughs> you know? I think it's an interesting study in human nature though, isn't it? ultimately we are all very different and we all respond to different things differently and no one understands the brain 
yet. You know, mental health is something that we still don't really understand. And you can be the most successful person. You can walk yeah. on the moon, be in that first lunar mission and struggle with depression. You can miss the moon. You can have a spaceship blow up and come back with a really positive attitude. I can see how you can do something really successful at a certain point in your life and get depressed because you know you can't reach that height again. Yep. And I can see why when you've gone through something and it's not gone so well, you've had some failure or some setback, it can urge you on to keep going. So you can see that how both of those can end up in that position. It's just a really fascinating thing. You've got these two people who both had very similar experiences in terms of that era of NASA, uh, being test pilots, so on and so forth. And, they, and you have two such contrasting outlooks afterwards. Yeah, like you said, I think it speaks a lot to like nobody can predict what the human brain does yeah. and how you react to certain things. But I've met people who are, you know, you would think are extremely successful and they struggle with stuff. And in my mind, you know, in the past, I would always think, well, why are they struggling with anything? They've got all the money in the world. If I had mm -hmm. the money they had, I'd be thrilled. I don't think I honestly realized until I got much older that it has nothing to do with any of that. No. You can't control what your brain is doing. Yeah. If the chemistry is off, you can't fix that on your own. Yeah. And also, in fairness to Buzz, he's written books later in his life. The last one that he released has that positive outlook yeah. about finding the meaning for his life after Apollo, after that depression and, and all the other things he went on to do. So in, in the context of he wrote that other one in 1973, where he was at that point in his life, very different. I think it, even within a life, one person will go through different phases and moods and all that kind of stuff where you're in different mindsets. It's just a really fascinating thing to study. And I, I kind of hope you do do a blog post on this. Yeah. I think it will be... I think it will be different from other things you've done. I think you're you're exploring a different avenue, still looking at space because you're, you're you're using a case study of two astronauts, but it's just something different to think about for people to think about. I think this discussion has also been wonderful as a result. I, th I think it's really interesting to to think about these kind of things. Yeah, like I said, Buzz was in a very different place in his life. He was much younger at the time, and he still. I mean, Buzz is in his nineties now, so he had a lot of life to live. Yeah. As you said, you know, he has written, you know, books where he's talked about, you know, he he redeveloped his joy for life again. Mm. He did stop drinking and he did get help and things like that. So I want to make it clear, you know, he wrote that book through a very different lens. But um, I love looking at like how people just deal with different things. Yeah. And it's not to say, well, you know, this person, you know, is right or wrong. I think what happened to buzz you know the instant celebrity and and having to come off this crazy moon trip and then you know go on this world tour i don't think buzz at that time was a very socially adept person i think he was a little more introverted than he is probably today i i really think for him that was traumatizing mm. i think they threw way too much at neil buzz and mike right after they came back you know they had to do this world tour and meet with dignitaries and stuff and people well that sounds like fun and i'm like Ugh. i try to put myself in that position like it would be fun but at the same time i would be nervous all the time you have to make speeches and stuff i mean that's a lot of pressure every day because you have to be on on top of your game you can't yeah. be like look i don't feel good today my stomach hurts i don't want to do it you know? <laughs> and, and you're a person who's dedicated themselves to flying and to orbital mechanics and not necessarily doing public speaking, not yeah. necessarily being a public figure. That's not That wasn't necessarily your end game there. Almost certainly wasn't. It just was to go and do those things. So to have that thrust upon you, yeah, they, they, they kind of knew it was going to happen a little bit, but when you're actually living it, it's very different. Equally, as much as I love the idea of this comparison between Buzz's book uh, in 1973, 74, and the new Fredo book. An equally interesting comparison is the old book and his later books from Buzz himself. Yeah. Because to see see someone talk about the same instances from different perspectives in, in their life, someone who has struggled with those things, is valuable. It's a, it's a really great snapshot into the understanding the, the human mind and someone who's had those experiences. Yeah, and how people adapt differently, I guess, over time. Yeah, I don't want to drag other astronaut books into it, but I also think of Warden's book 
as well because Al went through some trauma too after he came back to Earth. That was not his fault. Very different from what yeah. Fredo and Buzz went through. I think if Al had written Falling to Earth 30 years before, like in 1980, let's for example, it would have been a very different book. It wouldn't have been the same yeah. book as the one that's a classic because he had so much more time to sort of process what happened and really to handle how to deal with that situation with people. But wouldn't it also be interesting to see what he would have written in 1980? Didn't you know what I mean? Like, yes. actually, it would have been amazing to also read that. But at least we've got a very, very, as you say, a classic in Falling, F Falling From Earth because yeah. he did take the time. Uh, but uh, And that's kind of what I'm getting at, that actually. I think all these per perspectives, no matter when it was done, are really fascinating. If he had written it 1980, it wouldn't have been falling. It would have been like Dispatches from Pettysville or something. <laughs> like he would have, It would have been a different book entirely, which would have been yeah. amazing. But at the same time... It's kind of neat to see what Falling to Earth became because I, I think it's a classic. Absolutely. So I agree. So uh, obviously we spoke a lot about Fred Hayes there. We have an interview with him, that which we did back on episode 47. I'm sure many of you have listened to that already. If you haven't, go and check it out because it's one of my proudest things that Emily and I have done, that, in, that interview. Just look in your podcast provider or in our archives on our website. Stand by one. Next up, Dave, I believe you got something in the mail last week. Yes, I did. Now, you may remember that we interviewed Andy Saunders back on episode 86 about the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16 because he just remastered some wonderful images from that mission and shown new detail that we'd never seen before. Well, he told us in that interview that he had a book coming out later in the year called Apollo Remastered, and it's come out in the UK. I believe it's out next month in the US. Yeah, in October. I, I have it on pre-order. So this turned up, and this is a, it's a big old book, big square book, and it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever had. Now, I've wow. got other photo books, Emily. I'm sure you've got plenty of Apollo photo books and space photo books, but this is hands down the best one I've ever opened. Now, what makes this different is that other photo books potentially are a collection of photos which are scans of scans of scans you know reproductions of the original images as they were printed at the time when they were printed rather quickly as they were first brought back and then the negatives were put in a freezer to store them in building eight at johnson space center and for 50 years they sat in that freezer unopened and then recently because the technology now exists we've got high definition scans of those original negatives which i think if you ask the right people you'll be able to get and that's what andy's done and he used modern techniques to draw out details that we've never seen before in some of our favorite photos. And he's found photos. He's gone through every single photo. He's found other photos which I'd never seen before, probably because at the time they didn't think they were worth anything because the way they were developed meant they looked like a black photo, whereas he's gone in and found the image within the darkness. It's just an incredible document, this book everyone who's into the Apollo program needs to own. It starts off with the pre-Apollo days. There's a few select photos from the Mercury program and the Gemini program, and they're really beautiful photos I'd never seen. Amazing stuff. And then it goes through chronologically through the Apollo program. And if you go through this book chronologically, I know the temptation when you get a photo book is just to open it anywhere. And you can do that with this book and enjoy a photo, have it on your coffee table every now and then, pick it up, open it up, see what you get. But going through this book chronologically is amazing because as you go through those early photos and then Apollo 7, and then you get to Apollo 8, and you get to that first photo of the moon or from the, of the Earth from a distance... If you have the same experience that I had, as you turn that page onto those images, your breath will be sucked out of your lungs and you, you'll be moved to tears. I was moved to tears numerous times reading this book. And they're just photos. I've seen most of them before. But the way he's presented them, the way he's pulled out all this extra detail, it's just incredible. So Andy, over the course of the last week, has been everywhere in the UK. You couldn't have turned the TV on over the weekend and not seen him. And isn't that amazing that 
the Apollo program, 50 years later, as we're still talking about Artemis, is getting this much news attention because of this book. I think it's amazing. What he's doing is amazing, and he's making people excited about it again. So there's some events coming up for this as well. If you're in the UK and you can get to the Albert Hall, you're going to any event at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Between September 21st and November 1st, there are 50 large-scale photographs on display. If you're not going to any events during that time period, there are four open days, September 24th, the 29th, October 7th and October 21st, where you can go along. There's also a public sign-in event for the book, which is on the 29th of September, I believe, from 10 till 2. So if you can get down there, get a copy of the book, meet Andy, get him to sign it, always a lovely thing. Then there's also going to be an exhibit in Glasgow at the Glasgow Science Centre from November 24th to April 16th. Uh, next year. Uh, There's a lecture that's going to take place, but I think that's sold out, I'm afraid. And then in February next year, there's also an exhibit that's going to happen over in the United Arab Emirates. Some point after April next year, there's going to be another one uh, in the northwest of England somewhere. And it also on the website says that USA venues are to be arranged. So I'm fairly sure he's going to get out there at some point with this. But yeah, this book is something you've just got to get a copy of. I've only seen the cover of the book that has Jim McDivitt on the cover, and that's one of my favorite pictures of any Apollo astronaut of all time. I I just think it's beautiful. Like, I think he was in the lunar module in that photo, and there's just something about, like, that's so evocative about that photo because he looks so tired, but he looks so hopeful at the same time. And he's got some five o'clock shadow. You can tell he's been up there for a few days, and... I love that photo uh, so much. Yeah, it's a beaut. There's a lot of great ones in there, though. I do have it on pre-order, and I cannot wait to get it. I've I've been checking my Amazon every day <laughs> <laughs> since I pre-ordered it to be like, is it coming yet? Is it shipped yet? Everybody over in the UK is like, have you gotten it? And I'm like, no, we're getting it a month later. It, which is wonderful. I mean, that never happens. <laughs> we, we never yeah, get Yeah, usually it's first. the other way. Anyway, details of this book and where to get it from and about the events will be in the show notes. Along with everything we're talking about, the show notes are always pretty comprehensive. Go and check them out. You can find them on the website, spaceandthingspodcast.com. And if you listen to this episode a few weeks later, there's an archive page as well. But in the description of every podcast, there's a direct link to the show notes. It came in peace for all mankind. Right, let's get on with this week's news stories. Since we last recorded, there have been five launches, three in China, and two more SpaceX Falcon 9 launches, one in California and one in Florida. And the CEO of SpaceX, Elon Musk, has said that he expects the company to perform 100 launches in 2023, which would be quite the achievement, given the fact that in 2021, the combined total number of space launches from all countries and companies was just over 140. And we're already on 113 for this calendar year and SpaceX has only got 40 of those. I know that's a lot of them but that's a long way short of 100 so that does require quite the big jump but when you see them doing two in a week from different parts of America you can see that that might happen soon. Maybe not next year but he's saying it will. We will see. That's going to mean I'm going to be out in my driveway a lot (laughs) next year. I'm just going to camp out in my driveway. (laughs) And as I'm sure you all are already aware, we did not have the Artemis 1 launch this week in Florida. Uh, The second launch attempt was scrubbed due to a hydrogen leak. To fix this, will take longer than the current launch window can stay open. Uh, It closes on September 6th, which is two days before this podcast is released. So technically it closes today. As we're recording, yeah. As we're recording. Uh, The next window of opportunity is September 16th to October 4th, and there's another window from October 17th to October 31st. So we might get a spooky launch. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Depending on how the repair goes, that will ultimately decide the outcome. But with NASA's Crew-5 launch due to take place on October 3rd, it's easy to see NASA deciding to bring the rocket back to the vehicle assembly building to undertake the repairs and going for the later launch dates. So while ultimately we'd, we'd all love for this launch to happen, the success of the mission is so important that these delays are really a necessary evil. Uh, we've seen NASA get go fever before, and I don't think anybody wants this to happen again. As we said many times before, also, uh, scrubs are normal. Scrubs for newer rockets are even more normal. So, so far it hasn't scrubbed for really an unreasonable amount of times by any rocket standard. 
Yeah, two scrubs. It's not a, not a bad thing really so far, is it? We've seen Rocket Scrub many, many times before they launch. So we're well within the window of, yeah, this is fine. Yeah, Shuttle was nuts. I think there's a, a statistic that a friend of mine told me, and I think Shuttle scrubbed 40 almost half the time yeah. during the whole program. I yeah. mean, it never went on time. Or there are a few occasions where the mains would light up, and then that was it. Yeah. And then I remember one case that they lit up, and then they set the pad on fire, which was exciting. Mike yeah. Mullane was there for that one. So, yeah, you'd rather you'd rather get it right. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, elsewhere, it's been a week for engine test firings. Over in Texas, SpaceX undertook a static fire test of three engines at once out of the 33 which exist on their super heavy booster rocket. They've twice previously fired one engine at a time, so they're making progress in getting this rocket ready for its first test launch, which could happen in the next month or two. Meanwhile, Astra has also been testing engines for their Rocket 4, which they recently announced was getting the company's full attention after they've stopped production of their Rocket 3, which had some high-profile failures. Rocket Lab have also been doing an engine test. For the first time, they've fired up one of their Rutherford engines as they strive to make the first stages of their Electron rocket reusable. This was a 200-second test fire uh, of an engine which has already flown, and it showed that the engine worked just as well as the first time it was used. And this one, close to my heart, the startup company Blue Shift Aerospace performed another 10-second static fire of their modular adaptable rocket engine for vehicle launch, also known as Marvel 2.0. This novel hybrid rocket engine burns non-toxic, carbon-neutral, bio-derived solid fuel. The test achieved ignition and stable flow through the engine and achieved full power for five seconds. Future tests will perform full duration tests of 90 seconds before a suborbital launch of their Starless Rogue launch vehicle in 2023. So you may remember that we interviewed the CEO and founder of Blue Shift Aerospace in episode 34. So go and check that out if you haven't heard it. It's a great little company they've got in Maine. On Saturday, September the 3rd, Solar Orbiter, a joint ESA and NASA mission led by ESA, had a flyby of Venus for some bonus science. Uh, this mission is already capturing the closest images of the sun that we've ever seen, but the probe uses Venus to adjust its orbit and get even closer. So this presents us with a chance to look at Venus as well. In particular, it's looking at the mysterious magnetic field which Venus has. Unlike the Earth's magnetic field, which is caused by the motion of the molten metal, in our core, Venus has an induced magnetic field as a result of the interaction between the thick atmosphere and the solar wind. However, just before the solar orbiter was due to make its flyby, uh, it was hit by a huge burst of charged particles from the sun's upper atmosphere. Uh, a corona shot out of the sun on August 30th in the direction of Venus, but fortunately the orbiter is designed to measure that kind of outburst and also withstand that solar assault. So this is a fascinating mission, which we should do really a full episode on at some point. Yeah, I think so. Meanwhile, I love that phrase, though, solar assault. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a, I got assaulted by the sun this weekend and my face, <laughs> is, my face is now peeling a bit. So, yeah, you feel the solar orbiter's pain. Yes, it burns. <laughs> Meanwhile, on the ISS, two Russian cosmonauts completed a 7-hour and 47-minute spacewalk on September 2nd, and more than made up for the spacewalk, which was cut short two weeks ago due to a battery problem in one of the suits, which didn't reoccur. The cosmonauts managed to get one hour and ten minutes ahead of their timeline, which enabled them to perform a number of extra jobs that they weren't expected to do. Their main job was to finish a number of tasks to configure the new European robotic arm. It was the eighth spacewalk for cosmonaut Oleg Artemyev and the fourth for Denis Matviev. Following our talk last week with Mark McCorkran about JWST, the telescope has been throwing out even more incredible Data. <laughs> it has managed to capture its first direct photo of an exoplanet. Exoplanets have normally been photographed due to light changes of the stars they orbit. But we've been able to see these planets move directly in front of the stars from our perspective. But this time it's taken a photo of a gas giant called HIP65426. That's a beautiful name. Yeah, catchy. <laughs> catchy. And it appeared as a tiny splotch close to a glowing star using two different infrared cameras. 
This planet was first discovered by the Very Large Telescope. Yes, that's its name in Chile back in 2017. Uh, Webb isn't really designed to discover new exoplanets, but to give us more details on exoplanets discovered by the big ground telescopes. This is just more proof that JWST is going to deliver us so, so much. Yeah, yeah, this is really fascinating. You know, the idea of actually seeing that planet on its own without it having to have moved in front of a star for us to be able to figure there's something there is quite something. Yeah. Yeah, it's demonstrating that it's got a lot of capabilities. Yeah, 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 yeah. All within two months of it becoming fully commissioned. Crazy. Yep. Uh, Meanwhile on Mars, this story is crazy. NASA's Perseverance rover has been doing something very cool. On board the rover is the Mars Oxygen In-Situ Resource Utilization Experiment or MOXIE for short. Uh, It's designed to transform carbon dioxide, which is 96% of the Martian atmosphere, into breathable oxygen, which is obviously critical for human exploration on the planet. So since February 2021, the device has been turned on seven times, and each time it's produced 0.2 ounces, which is about six grams, of oxygen per hour, which is about what one small tree can produce on Earth. This is so cool. I think we should do it again. I think we should do a full episode on this as well. They are creating oxygen on another planet. We're going to need that someday if we go there. So that's that's a big help. That is amazing. So cool. That is so cool. And finally, in another amazing story, it's been 45 years since Voyager 1 launched. And you may remember us talking about a glitch, which meant that the data we were receiving from the probe, which is now in interstellar space, was all a bit strange. But NASA has managed to fix the problem. Uh, Basically, the antenna was trying to send the data back to Earth via a dead computer on board. So now we're getting the correct telemetry data from the probe, but there's a lot of head scratching going on as they try to figure out why this happened. We've all had computers that have messed up, but imagine trying to trying to fix one that's nearly 50 years old. uh, And then imagine trying to do that while you're nearly mm, 15 billion miles away from it. Those people at NASA are just ridiculously clever. Yeah, nuts. Absolutely nuts. program that's it for this week we hope you enjoyed our discussions and i hope you don't mind that we didn't have one main focus this week if we had time there's enough going on right now for us to be doing two or three episodes a week and not run out of things to say maybe one day which feels like a nice segue into promoting our patreon page <laughs> which has nearly 50 members uh, all of you are really helping us be able to do this and if more people join we might be able to do more episodes and In December, Emily and I will finally be together in person to attend a big event at the Cosmosphere in Kansas on December the 2nd. I'm going to put links to that in the description for those of you who might want to look to get a ticket as well. But hopefully we'll be able to record some episodes together as well. I'm talking with the museum about this and maybe we'll be able to invite some of our Patreons into those recordings if you are also attending that event. So just let us know if you're going to be there. Yes, and I am so excited about this. This is really going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. I've never, I've never been to the Cosmosphere, and I am so psyched for this. And you've never met me in person. I know. I've never met you in person. I know. (laughs) I know. No, I know. It it is so weird, and I know you're very tall. So just be advised. (laughs) I'm a foot and a half shorter than you. If you see a little person coming at you, that's probably me. And uh, yeah. (laughs) Also, a massive thank you for all those who uh, listen and continue to share the podcast with your friends. You're all amazing, and don't forget, in space, no one can hear you. Me. Space and things has been brought to you by and things productions.